Tell me whom you love, and I'll tell you who you are. This expression is one that is used often in the black community in the United States. And the picture it paints and the core truth about identity that it reveals is incredibly relevant for today. What this expression points out is that when it comes to identity, it is often formed based on our relationships. So much so that when we lose someone we love, we are forced to contend not only with the loss of that person, but also with losing a sense of ourselves. And often a redefining process takes place. And this points to something bigger. Any loss, change, or disruption to how we see ourselves creates a prism of human emotion, from anger and fear to uncertainty and sadness. Right now, we are living in a time of massive change. The whole world is caught up in this. And it is challenging how we see ourselves even pulling at the threads of our identity, triggering that prism of human emotion. And these natural reactions are being hardened or even worse, weaponized for political gain to the detriment of core democratic principles, such as freedom of the press, an open society, and inclusivity the same principles that are mission critical to the success of our industry as a tech community that allows for us to continue to create a culture of innovation and creativity that's sustainable. From election interference in the United States and in elections around the world, on Facebook and other social media platforms, to the use of game chat rooms by ideological extremists to plan harm, this battle is being waged on the very technology that we built. And where does this lead? In the United States, in Parkland, Florida, earlier this year, there was a tragic high school shooting. And the students got together to bravely lend their voice to the call for gun control. One of those students is Emma Gonzalez. A video of Emma Gonzalez tearing a shooting range target in a PSA against gun violence was manipulated to make it appear as though she was ripping apart the Constitution. This video went viral, so much so that CNN and other news outlets had to debunk this false story. The technology already exists that allows for the manipulation and altering of videos, audio, and digital content. It's pointing to a future in which those who would seek to sow discord or cause harm could manipulate images, including that of world leaders, that could be nearly indistinguishable from the real thing. So what can we do about this? This may seem daunting, but I see a silver lining. I see it as opportunity. We built these tools, so we have the power and the responsibility to take action and to use technology to not only meet the needs of our end users, but also to think about our responsibility to our fellow citizens and our responsibility to protect democracy. It starts with we as a tech community making sure that when we think about what our collective identity is, we inoculate ourselves against the weaponization of fear when it comes to diversity and change. And then we need to come together and figure out how we can create technology that helps mitigate against bias and reduce harm. This is a complex challenge. There are no easy answers or simple solutions. And it will require a diverse coalition of technologists, innovators, researchers, community advocates, and government entities working together. But I believe if we work together, we can solve this. 
We also have the opportunity to use technology to directly impact people's lives for good by changing how we do service delivery, which increases the well-being in our societies, restores faith in those institutions that are there to serve them, and helps us strengthen democracy. Hello, my name is Kat Posey. I am really honored to be here with you today. I am the founder of Tech by Superwomen, a platform I started in 2011 as a way to reshape the conversation on women in tech to one that focuses on data and the nature of culture and make it a conversation for everyone because we're all invested in it. And really look at what are the outcomes we're driving for? What is the innovation we can unlock when we make sure that everyone can thrive? Currently, I work at Capital One. I'm on the leadership team for the Center of Machine Learning in the technology organization. Most recently, I had the privilege and honor of working for President Obama at the United States Digital Service, which is a tech startup that he founded as a way to use technology to better serve veterans and students, immigrants and refugees. I am here today speaking in my personal capacity, and I'm really excited because I get to share it with my sister, Patricia Posey, who's here today, and she is the COO of Tech Superwomen. I currently live in San Francisco, but I'm from Anchorage, Alaska. That's where I was born and raised. And so being in another northern city reminds me a lot of home. I've really enjoyed my time in Stockholm. I got in Thursday. And I've been impressed with the community here. And I remain inspired by the fact that Sweden has been leading the world and for a long time when it comes to gender equity. So I know I'm among folks who fundamentally get the value of making sure we create society built on equality. The truth is, when it comes to tech, the global community has struggled with diversity and inclusion. And none of us are immune. Here are some numbers. 11, 5, 2. 11% of tech founders in the EU who received VC funding in 2017 were women. PricewaterCooper reports that only 5% of leadership roles in technology in 2017 in the UK were held by women. And in the United States, Fortune had a devastating report when it said that women only received 2% of funds from VCs in 2017. And here are some additional stats. Of the 1.4 billion invested in Swedish startups in 2017, all women teams received less than 1%. A survey by the tech site Die Digital found that 88% of all venture capital went to all male teams. The root causes for these statistics are complex but really distill down into the way that bias, both implicit and explicit, can become structural and systemic, resulting in fewer women and people of color entering tech in the first place, and then those that do leaking out of the pipeline. I think one of the statistics that really brings this home is what the Harvard Business Study found. In 2008, Harvard Business School study found that 56% of women are dropping out of technical careers mid-career. This is double the attrition rate of their male peers. Digging deeper into why, the Talent Innovation Center did research and found that 63% of women reported harassment and aggressions as the leading cause, and this statistic held globally. So we have a lot of work to do. It starts with how we are defining our identity as tech community and making sure that it's grounded in the real history of how technology space has continued to innovate. Megan Smith is an absolute inspiration to me. She was the third US CTO. She worked for President Obama, and she was the first woman to hold the position. And she has this expression she uses a lot. She says, you can't be what you can't see. Representation matters. 
it matters for everyone. If men don't know the value and contributions women have made in tech, that's an issue. If women don't know their rightful place in technology, that's an issue. I spoke at the We Code Summit in Harvard in 2016, and you had computer science students from all over the world there, and woman after woman, these students told stories of, you know, regardless of the institution they came from, their stories all had a similar theme, which was that the men in their class told them that women never contributed to technology. The Pricewater Cooper study that I referenced earlier also interviewed students, and they found only 22% of students could name a famous woman in technology, whereas two-thirds could name a famous man. Now, we do a disservice to everyone if we don't correct this narrative. Ada, Grace, Catherine, Susan, these names should be just as well known as Thomas and Alan and Bill and Steve. As many of you know, Ada Lovelace was the first computer programmer. Admiral Grace Hopper is a pioneer in tech who created the first compiler. Math prodigy Katherine Johnson is a NASA pioneer and one of the brilliant minds that created the math for orbital spaceflight. Susan Kerr is a modern-day icon in tech, and she actually created many of the interfaces and types that we still use today during her time at Apple Macintosh. We have to bring our hidden figures into the light. It's so important that people understand the history of technology has always been propelled by diverse teams working together. And what becomes possible when we create a culture where everyone can thrive? When we create a company where we have a diverse and inclusive team? Well, a recent McKinsey study joins a chorus of studies that show it pays. Companies in the top quartile for gender diversity are 15% more likely to have financial returns above their competitors. And companies that are in the top quartile for race and ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to have financial returns above national industry means. So the data is compelling. Let's look at an example. How many people here, by show of hands, use Slack? I read an interview with uh, the CEO, Stuart Butterfield, and he said that 90% of startups in Sweden use Slack. So it's a pretty popular product. Did you know that it was built by one of the most diverse teams in tech? There was a profile in Atlantic Magazine in spring of this year that actually dug into the numbers after Slack released its diversity report. It also looked at it in the context of other tech companies. So when you think of major tech, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, on average, women hold between 19 and 28 percent of all leader, of leadership roles at those companies and between 19 and 20 percent of technical roles. At Slack, women hold 31% of the leadership teams, and they hold 34% of the technical roles. When it comes to underrepresented minorities, on average at these large tech companies, underrepresented minorities hold between 4 and 8% of all technical roles, and they represent less than 11% of the companies themselves. At Slack, underrepresented minorities make up 13% of all technical roles, and they, hold, they make up 13% of the company. Additionally, they hold 6% of leadership roles. I think at one point, Slack had 7% black women engineers. So they are doing incredible work. And the article dug into, well, what's working? How are they doing this? And it's really by thinking outside the box, from changing how they recruit by expanding outside of the traditionally small pool of feeder schools, 
to making sure they continue to push on creating a culture where diversity and inclusion is seen as everyone's job and not the responsibility of any one person, to even changing how they do the hiring process, eliminating the whiteboard coding exercises and replacing them with a blind code review. As someone who knows and has good friends who both work currently in Slack and who have worked in the past, I feel confident I can say a lot of this is credit to the staff, the early employees who really pulled the company forward on these issues. And making those investments early is really creating a culture of diversity and inclusion. They don't even have a head of diversity. Now, Slack is not perfect, but I think they serve as a great example for those of us building companies to look towards and to look at some of the things that are working and see how we can implement that. So we've looked at the data. We've seen the challenges we face as a tech community. We've seen the opportunity and what happens when we get it right. I want to turn our attention now towards what's happening in our world and how that's playing out in our platforms and products. Here are some photos from recent headlines around the world that show that we are truly living through a time of massive economic, political, and social change. From fear to distrust to anxiety. And what's driving this? We know there's rising inequality and change to the nature of work and even job loss due to emerging technologies such as automation and artificial intelligence. Combine that with additional social and economic factors, and it's all converging to whip up that prism of human emotion that's being manipulated and exploited to divide communities. And we see this as the rise of ethnic nationalism spreads. What concerns me even more is that research shows that once these attitudes harden, it becomes much harder to dissolve them. As this report from Brookings pointed out, which found that even as the economic recovery in Europe has gathered pace and unemployment has declined, the spread of this populism has continued. All around the world, people are fleeing crisis and war and immigrating into new countries. Security concerns and culture concerns are flaring back in response. And people are starting to look for factional, even ethnic lines to reassert some sense of control. If we are not careful, democracy will hang in the balance. And these natural reactions and attitudes that are forming and being hardened are happening due to misinformation, propaganda, and it's being spread on our platforms. We see it sweeping the world from Brazil to Philippines to Poland. When I think about censorship, and propaganda, I think of them as two sides of the same coin. If censorship is about controlling information, then propaganda and its cousin, misinformation, are about obscuring it. Like a denial of service attack, they overwhelm your cognitive functions, limiting or even disabling your ability to discern what is true and what is false. The sheer volume of content is part of the strategy when weaponizing information. And it's working. Here's just one study that MIT did recently about propaganda and the internet. It found, for example, that a lie on Twitter is 70% more likely to be retweeted and engaged with than factual information. And that a false story reaches 1,500 people six times faster than a true story on average. And this phenomenon is particularly acute in political news. 
One of the experts I really admire, that I think has been very incisive for a long time on this issue, is Rene de Resta. Rene is currently the director of research at New Knowledge and the head of policy at Data for Democracy. She co-authored a piece on justsecurity.org that really points out that when it comes to information warfare, it's a cybersecurity issue with one distinct difference. When lawmakers think of cybersecurity, they tend to think of network intrusions. Her piece points out that information warfare, by contrast, is an attack on cognitive infrastructure, on people themselves, on society and on systems of information and belief. Its targets are diffuse and widespread. So what can we do about this? As I mentioned in my opening, this is a complex issue, and it will require multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approaches to solve. I want to highlight for you three potential areas that I think are bright seeds that if we continue to grow and invest in, I think will have a material impact. The first is this concept of a code of ethics. DJ Patel was the first chief data scientist in the United States. He worked for President Obama. And he's a world-renowned and respected data scientist. He wrote a piece in February of this year calling for a code of ethics, inspired by the Hippocratic Oath that doctors take. The concept is that data scientists should hold themselves and their profession accountable to a higher ethical standard. There's even a global Slack channel that people can join to help drive this concept forward. I think about Cambridge Analytica. If we had had this movement 10 years ago, 15 years ago, would they have been able to do what they did? And if they had, would they have had the air cover as researchers to manipulate people for political gain? Another important movement out there is how can we address the pipeline earlier? How can we integrate ethics into computer science curriculum? The Responsible Computer Science Challenge has been issued by Omidyar Networks in partnership with Mozilla Foundation, Schmidt Futures, and others. And it's pushing on educational institutions to integrate ethics into their curriculum. I would add we need to include gender studies and race and ethnic studies as well. Imagine what future builders could do if they have a shared framework and a shared understanding of how to think about these issues. If they start thinking about it early, so as we are building products, tools, and new companies, we have an expansive view of what is possible and what's our responsibility. We also can use tech and bring it into the fight. I think this is one of the areas I'm really personally excited about, which is how can we use algorithms to fight against bias? There's been a lot of important news looking at the potential harm. For example, New Scientist did a study on ways that algorithm is help, algorithms are helping perpetuate bias, and one of the examples they used was this tool called PredPol. And PredPol is a predictive algorithm that had good intentions. The goal was to remove human bias from policing by using algorithms to determine when and where crimes would most likely occur. But what we know and what we continue to learn is that data sets, data sets can be biased too. Human Rights Data Analyst Group reported that PredPol was leading to prejudiced results targeting communities of color based on race, regardless of the true crime rates of those areas. And just last month, Amazon was in the news. They were using an algorithm to help them in their hiring process and accelerate that process. And they shelved it when they discovered that it was systematically downgrading women candidates. So we know this is a challenge. One of the brightest minds on this is Joy. Joy Boulamwini is the founder of the Algorithmic Justice League. 
She is also an MIT researcher. And she is leading the charge on this concept that we can use tools to audit algorithms for, to detect bias, and also create algorithms that fight against it. She has something that I think was really insightful that I wanted to share. She says, when not analyzing models for gender, racial, or socioeconomic skews does not remove bias. Instead, it masks potential problems. The firms that effectively use AI will be the ones that are intentional about the full spectrum inclusion during the design, development, and deployment of their automated decision-making systems. And I think this is such a powerful point. You can start early, you can start at the point where you are training the algorithms to reduce the likelihood of bias by training on diverse data sets. You can also use algorithms in the fight. Tech companies are getting in on this. Right? We already know that Microsoft with their Oracle product and Facebook with their Fairness Flows product are now beginning to build tools and solutions that bring algorithms into the fight against bias. This is so critical because AI is going to rewrite so much of how we experience our world. And so we need our brightest minds in research, in tech, in government, working together to come up with smart solutions. I want to talk about now how we can use technology to directly impact citizens. So I mentioned earlier, I had the privilege of working at the United States Digital Service. It was inspired by the government digital services in the UK. It was also inspired by e-government in Estonia and is part of a movement of different agencies, including 18F, Presidential Innovation Fellows, that are all working together to change how we deliver services for the American people. I want to go over just one example quickly with you of how this has been used and some of the results we're able to drive. So the process to immigrating, immigration in the United States was entirely paper-based. So much so that the postage budget annually was $300 million from shipping those files and mailing those files all over the world. So I think anyone who looked at that would say, that's very inefficient and we should do something about it. And that's exactly what happened. In the early 2000s, an effort was underway to modernize the immigration system. With a budget of $1.7 billion, and seven years to the first customer-facing deliverable, in other words, a waterfall delivery process, you can imagine what happened. It didn't work. Thankfully, when the effort went underway to try this again, United States Digital Service and this coalition of other agencies that cared a lot about technology were on the ground and were able to intercede. We were able to ship the first product in six months which is the process for applying to renew your green card. This was done using some of the things that our community maybe even takes for granted when we think about how you build good products, but were new concepts in government that really helped us push forward. Understanding what people need, a user-centered design process, building services with agile and iterative practices. As I mentioned before, the first project didn't have anything delivered until seven years in. In six months, we had one service up. This ongoing iterative process also allows you to build as you go and improve as you go, as real users start using the product. Supporting budgets and contracts to support delivery. I would say across the global community doing this work, this is probably the most important leverage, which is changing the procurement process and structuring how we build these products to look towards delivery. Another quick example is Code for America. Code for America's founder and executive director is Jen Polka. She is also the architect, of the, one of the architects of the United States Digital Service. And this is Jasmine Latmer, she is the head designer for their social justice and safety team. 
And one of the things that they are tackling right now that I find really inspiring in terms of addressing, delivering better services at a local level is in California. There are five million people who are eligible for some sort of record clearance or expungement. Think about the civil rights such as voting and access to services that unlock. Unfortunately, due to the complex bureaucracy and application process, both for those applying and those for administrating the process, only 8% of Californians had successfully gone through. As Jasmine says, and I think this is a great picture of what we have to think about when we're building tools for citizens, justice means getting the implementation right. And so Code for America did the work using human-centered design and modern technology development processes to develop this app called Clear My Record. And they are on track to help a, over a quarter of a million people clear their record in 2019 and with plans to scale this across the United States. I want to conclude today with a th another thought on identity. This is a quote from Shakespeare. We know what we are, but not what we may be. And I love that because it's pointing out that when it comes to identity, it is also always evolving and we can choose to shape it with intentionality. We get to create identities that are inclusive. Identities that are not threatened when people of different ethnicities, nationalities, or faiths enter our world. Identities that are resilient and responsive instead of reactionary and reductive. Let's create one for tech based on shared values. And then let's help our societies do the same by how we build and what we built. It's true that our world is changing, but we are changing the world. So let's make sure it's for good. It starts by educating and defining for yourself why diversity matters and then building products and features and the policies that support them that encourage understanding and that defend against the weaponization of hate, fear, and distrust. We also have the opportunity to use technology to take direct action, strengthening our societies and in turn ensuring that the world gets better for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for an inspiring talk. And we have a little present for you as well. This I don't is know. I heard what you told Ed. So. Yeah. Um, this one is for <laughs> probably, in your case, like a little girl or somebody else who wants to get into the tech industry and build That's their own great. robots. So Thank you. Thank you so much. We enjoyed your talk. So much. Thank, Thank you. you.